and Lars Nedlin from White Void, um, also of Borkner and Solflad. This is an absolute pleasure, man. I am loving the White Void stuff as well. Thank you so much for joining Crank, myself, and that metal station for a chat. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Uh, man, f first off, I want to ask, how did this project get started for you? Well, it was kind of funny. It, it, it kind of start, started with the music because I, um, I wrote a few songs that didn't really fit into Borknagar or Solafold. I mean, my, my two other bands. And um, it's like when I sit down and I write music, I don't write specifically for a band. It just usually it just falls into one of those categories, right? Um, and I found out that I had a few songs that didn't really fit anywhere. Um, and I found out that they had a common denominator. And that was like the sort of 70s approach when it came, came to the basic music, you know, that, that sort of bluesy hard rock uh, core. Uh, and um, a, a sort of new wavy um, uh, melody sense, you know, the, the way that the melodies, the vocals were constructed was slightly reminiscent of like the, the new wave from the early 80s. Uh, and I like that, you know, I, I was born in the 70s and I grew up with this music. So I thought, well, I, I want to make some few, uh, a few more songs like that and, and just see where that takes me. Um, and that worked really well. It was really fun to write. Just, you know, um, I was in a flow when it came to writing that music. So before you knew it, I'd written a full album. Um, and I sat down and I thought, well, I want to do something proper with this. You know, I can't just make an album and just let it lie there and or just make, you know, a project and just play everything myself. So I thought, OK, I'm going to put together a band and I, I'm going to do this uh, properly. Uh, so I went out and I, I searched for, for some musicians that I thought would fit into this project because I, I didn't want this to be like a, a metal band. I wanted yeah. it to be rooted in rock. Um, so I didn't want to, to go to the usual suspects, you know, being part of the black metal movement. So I'd, I, I, I only have like black metal musicians around me. And, you know, if I drag those guys into this, it becomes something else. Um, so I found different people, uh, and yeah, uh, I was really lucky when it came to the guys that I found and that I sort of dragged kicking and screaming into this project. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, the, the rest is history, as they say, that's why we're sitting here talking together. It would have been a very cathartic process as well. Cause you're saying working with those black metal bands and projects, having these tracks as well, and then working on something completely different and you said you got into a flow it would have i suppose that would have been a real cathartic and good experience musically yeah. as because really what i found out was you know I've, I've always had um a really broad interest in music i've always listened to all kinds of music and i'm really preoccupied with jazz and with electronic music um uh, in parallel with the, the metal always listen to metal as well uh, and I've done a lot of stuff, uh, like touching into other genres, but, but I think that 70s rock, um, uh, 70s hard rock, the occult rock, like new Blue Oyster Cult or Coven, and, you know, those bands, and also the new wave. I mean, everything from like Duran Duran through Eurythmics to New Model Army. Um, I, I always listened to that music, but I never had the chance to sort of channel that inspiration into any of my uh, other bands. Uh, so when I opened that gate, uh, I found out that there was a lot of stuff that needed to flow through. <laughs> so yeah, it was a good, good process. Yeah, you're talking about jazz, and come to mind, I'm Jorgen Monkby. I've been um, hearing a lot of his sax bits all over the place, man. You know, that sounds yeah. so bloody well as well. And so it's a rock sound you guys have created. I love rock and roll, and it's good for me. And I always get annoyed when I see people going, rock's dead. And when I see bands like White Void and this <laughs> anti-album, I'm like, fuck you, rock's dead, mate. <laughs> No, rock's, rock's not dead. Rock's never going to die, but it goes in waves, you know? Um, I mean, music evolves and, and uh, the audience evolves. and It's like anything, though. You've got to look for it. You've got to track down albums like 
like especially White Void when I heard this I was like you know and there's some great rock albums I come across some great rock bands that are doing things today that have influences from that generation but making just fucking classic rock albums I suppose it's not getting caught in the 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 fucking top you know, where they throw all this stuff at you and go, you got to listen to this, but you've got to explore a little bit. I'm a musical explorer. I like to search yeah. for things and listen to whole albums and dive into things a little bit more. I agree. Uh, and uh, I mean, if you see the, um, if, if you see the big um, metal record companies, you see that they have quite a few rock bands now as yeah. well. I mean, more now than they used to back in the day. So I, I think it's more diverse now than it used to be. And also, I mean, when it comes to, to the audience and, and, and how they connect to genres, I think uh, the audience is more open to, to different expressions within, you know, the, the metal environment or the rock environment. So uh, I can see that now with, with the audience that usually listens to, to the more hardcore black metal stuff. Um, I'm, I'm getting a lot of, of um, email and messages uh, from people that, you know, connect to White Void, even though it's not that really hard music, because yeah. there's some there's something that connects connects us to to that part of the music environment as well. Uh, and it's not only me, you know, also being in some of those bands. It's, I guess, some sort of musical link as well. We carry some of that, you know, ear in us at some times from that environment over into the, the, the rock and roll framework that is White Void. Uh, at least I think so. That, that's how it feels. Yeah. Can you tell me about your songwriting process for this? Where did you draw for inspiration? Was this just a whole lot of ideas or? No, it was just a matter of me sitting down with a guitar and just start playing. Yeah, it's like I, I usually I write um, I usually write the bases of my songs on guitar, uh, which is kind of funny because guitar is not really my instrument. You know, I'm a terrible guitarist. Uh, but the good thing about being a terrible guitarist when you write is if it sounds like a good riff, it's a good riff. <laughs> Because I can't hide a bad riff. <laughs> and uh, there's, uh, there's been so many times I've, I've had a feeling that, yeah, this, this could be cool. And I play it as, nah, maybe if I could play it like that, well, I can't manage to play it like that. But if I need to play it like that, it, it's probably not a good riff. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, and the really fun thing was when... Uh, after I'd made all the demos, I just made simple demos of all the songs before I got the, the band members in. Um, and when we started to sit down, me and the guitarist, Avin, um, of White Void, and he would start to translate my riffs into his, you know, proper potent <laughs> 70s blues rock guitar playing, they would really open up. Uh, up. Uh, and yeah, that was really, uh, that was really fun experience. Uh, I think if he gets interviewed about that process at some point, I have to talk with him first, uh, in order to, to ensure that he just tells about the, you know, proper parts of it. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been a good, as you were saying, you know, cause you were sitting there with your guitar and then getting the bones of these tracks and having them fill that out in the band and fill out this vision that you'd originally had in your head going, this is what I want to do. It would have been a great experience to get in and start, I suppose, do that recording and production process and see where they were kind of filling out as well. And also working with musicians that come from a different, you know, uh, set of genres than I do. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he, he comes from, from the, the blues rock, the hard rock blues rock tradition. Uh, um, our drummer, Tobias, he, he comes from jazz and fusion. I mean, even though he, he can play black metal as good as anyone, I mean, he's an Ishan as well. Um, but but he's, <clears throat> you know, his basis as a drummer is in jazz and in fusion. And our bass player is actually an electronic guy. You know, he, he does electronic music more than anything. Uh, so just bringing them in uh, and letting them, you know, pick, pick everything to pieces and then putting, putting it to, back together again um with their approach when it comes to their instrumentation uh, in within the framework that i've set uh yeah that was a really rewarding process because i mean the, the songs they 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 changed character 
quite a lot from the early demos to the stuff that you hear on the album, even though they're clearly the same songs. It's just about how um, the instruments are handled and how things fit together, you know, that they just made everything much more beautiful in the way that uh, all the different parts interact. Yes, the musical voicings is amazing. And the, the track sit with you, I um, played that um, The Shovel and the Cross the other day on my show as well. Can you tell me a little bit about that track? I'm asking because that's the um, latest one I, I listened to on my show there as well. Yeah, well, um, that, that has really sort of, um, it has a mixture of the, the uh, like mid 80s new wave approach. Yeah. It's got bit of like the Billy Idol thing going in there, you know, that, that whole uh, cocky, like British attitude on, on the verses. Um, and then it sort of breaks out or it erupts, erupts into these choruses that I tried to build as um, like kind of soaring uh, in a way to, to create these contrasts to, um, to the basic riffing and, and the basic um you know versus the attitude we have there so that that's sort of the the basic musical idea um when it comes to the lyrics that's a whole different story because this this whole album is loosely based on on a philosophical direction called absurdism uh which was developed by uh, albert camus uh, the the french uh, algerian writer uh and the shovel and the cross is about uh, the points in uh, in your life where you actually um, understand that um, your existence is in its core absurd. There is no reason for you to to be here. There, there is no system uh, set in place for you that, that that tells you where you should go, what you should do. Um, <clears throat> so that's also why I made that video with my face literally falling to pieces because <laughs> it's it's about that process where you mentally sort of you, you have to pick everything apart before you start to to like piece it together and build it up again. Um, so it's uh, it's an interesting song in, in that respect for me when it comes to both the lyrical side and um, uh, when it comes to the musical side, because it's one of the songs that that have sort of the biggest uh, contrasts, I guess, within the same song. Yeah. So yeah, it was a fun song to to write and a very interesting song to uh, record and uh, a very interesting video to record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I seen that was some kind of clay face paint thing or something. Was it? What was that like? Yeah. <laughs> it felt felt a bit funny. Yeah. It took us about nine hours that makeup oh. stuff. So <laughs> oh, that, that, that's half the trouble, isn't it? All the behind the scenes stuff. People <laughs> yeah. just think, oh yeah, and they just put out an album, they just put out a film clip, and it's done. Well, no, <laughs> there's a lot of work behind the scenes. We we put out a, a behind the scenes video uh, on our YouTube channel. So if you uh, if you're interested to see how that thing was made, then then go check that out. <laughs> yeah, I oh, will. I'll put the link for that because I watched a little bit of that as well. That's why I had to mention it. It was cool. Yeah. That's last. Uh, then. Have you got anything planned for your release in a few days? Like any shows, I suppose. I was just chatting to a band from America. Well, it's just at the moment, it's... <laughs> Norway. Norway's in lockdown. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there, there aren't even any shops open here. There are no places... Uh, I mean, there are no places I can go and buy beer or anything. So, so yeah. So, that, so people can kind of get along and there's no excuses for them now to grab this White Void album, Anti. It comes out in a few yeah. days through Nuclear Blast Records. There's no excuses because for me, I spent a lot of 2020 lockdown. I bought a shit ton of records, bought a heap of merch, shirts, all sorts <laughs> of stuff. So just because we can't get along to live shows doesn't mean people can't go along and grab this Anti album from White Void, put it in their stereos and turn up really fucking loud. <laughs> Sounds like a very good plan if you ask me. Lars, you go, Next. man. Yeah, next year. Next year, they will be live playing. They'll be touring. They'll That's what I think. Back. 2021 is rooted. It's buggered. Don't even think about yeah. it. Um, 2022, hopefully get you guys to Australia. I'd love to see you live over yeah, this way as well. Yeah. It would be unreal. Uh, Lars, any last words, shout-outs, or thank yous you'd like to add in, mate, before we finish up? Just thanks a lot for uh, for having me on your show. I really hope we can come to, to Australia and play. I mean, that would be uh, that would be absolutely awesome. I would love to see you live, and I know a whole heap of Aussies would be mad for that as well. Lars, thank you very much. You have a 
nice day and stay safe, my friend. Thanks a lot. You too. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.